I think there's so much when we're able to verbally express something, we're able to put words to it and we can name it. Yes. That gives us this power to understand ourselves, understand yeah. our own experience. Hey everyone, welcome to another Family Care Learning Podcast. My name is Brandon Jones, and today I have with me Megan. Megan is one of our family coaches um, in our clinical department. And today, uh, so we're going to talk about the disenfranchised grief. Um, for those of you that have followed our podcast, maybe watched. Uh, if you remember Haley and her husband and her story in foster care, we hit on it a little bit of, of kind of their experience of disenfranchised grief. And so we wanted to take some time and just kind of zoom into what disenfranchised grief is and just to kind of increase your awareness a little bit with that. And so Megan, can you just share with me a little bit about how, how would you describe disenfranchised grief? What is it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think it's really important that we go back to really breaking down what these words mean. Yeah. Uh, to disenfranchise essentially means to deprive someone of a right or a privilege. Mm. So when we couple that with grief, which is this uh, experience of bereavement or distress, or um, you've lost something that has caused an incredible impact on your life, Yeah. we get this phenomenon where individuals are essentially being told that they are not allowed or they're not being permitted to grieve mm, um, yeah. for whatever reason. You know, it could be the how or the what of their loss. Yeah. It could be um, the length or the type of the grief, how they're choosing to express it or how maybe they aren't even aware that they're expressing it. Mm. So it's really um, to understand this means to understand that people aren't able or aren't feeling free to have this very human experience. Oh yeah. The, I, and, I, and as you're saying that, right, like the I'm thinking about, and so oftentimes this not having the right to, it's mm -hmm. not something where people are going, no, you can't grieve, mm -hmm. but it's these like minor reactions or not understanding or the lack of validating mm -hmm. the grief that I think it, so it, it can happen in all kinds of situations. So what are some of the, what are some of the causes of grief, someone who's grieving, but it, it goes beyond just grieving. It's kind mm -hmm. of a disenfranchised mm -hmm. grief. When do we see that usually happen? Yeah. So um, what we know from research and people who know more about this than I do <laughs> yeah. um, is that disenfranchised grief occurs when your loss goes against cultural norms. Okay. Um, it isn't seen as valid. You know, like you said, it's, they lack that validation. Um, it could even be from those closest to them or in their community yeah. uh, even, or their, their direct support networks. So this could look like um, a lot of times is families may get disenfranchised in their grief if they have a loved one that commits suicide, yeah. um, you know, or it could be if they have a loved one that dies to drug overdose mm. um, or is even just they haven't died, but there's an addiction where yeah. there's been a loss of that relationship yes. for whatever reason. Um, it could be um, people losing someone that they have a complicated relationship with. So mm. this, you know, we see this sometimes in um, when someone's remarried and then that ex spouse dies, yeah. you know, in whatever yeah. way. And that a lot of times when they're getting disenfranchised in that, it's kind of like, am I allowed to express fully how this yeah, impacts me? Yeah, yeah. Um, other times it could be, you know, I'm thinking just in current culture of families of criminals, you know, who are going to jail, you know, or parents of kids that have made choices that have resulted in, you know, any sort of punishment like that. Um, yeah. They've lost that child essentially. And a lot of times society kind of says, well, better off, mm, you know, like yeah, yeah, without even recognizing the loss that that family's experiencing. So, um, those are some of the broad and general strokes of yeah, how we yeah. see this in society and the people that get overlooked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, it, I think it's, it's so interesting, right? Because it's in those those smaller areas that not everyone can identify with mm -hmm. those experiences or 
if you haven't walked through that experience, you, you might miss a unique perspective of that person. I think that's why we see uh, loss related to foster care and adoption, yeah. right? Because yeah. there's so many people who are going, well, you kind of signed up for this. And so didn't you expect this to kind of happen? It's like, well, yeah, I did. But right. Like that whole kind of, I think back and forth is why I'm going, yeah, that makes perfect sense um, for just why that, ha that happens a lot of times in foster and adoptive families as well. So how, how do you know if it's disenfranchised grief or what, what does that look like in parents, children? Um, yeah. What does that look like for them? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of times this has to go through like what you said, like we see it in adoption and foster care when we're yeah. working in it. Yeah. Not everyone sees it. Um, I think some ways that we can see it in our families is, you know, with our foster families um, or our adoptive families when a child leaves the home yeah. through change in level of care. You know, maybe yes. it's a child that needs to move up to a higher level of care yeah. or they've completed their goals, which is a good thing. And they're moving down in level of care. Yeah. But I think in that a lot of times we overlook how this family has built a relationship with that child, whether for the positive or negative. Yeah. And they're are going to be, you know, likely some emotions that need some closure there or yeah. some to that relationship that often doesn't happen. Mm. Um, it could be through disruption, you know, which is something that yeah. I know is such a difficult topic, you know, for everyone involved in this journey. Um, we never, you know, it's obviously never the ideal. Yes. Um, but I think when we're able to recognize and honor, um, what's going into that disruption, you know, and understanding like, how can we help our families feel seen and heard? Yes, and how can yeah. we help them, you know, you know, understand where they're coming from? Yeah. And, and that's what I, one of the things I love about the family coaching team is that each individual family coach really kind of understands that and can even kind of lean into, yeah, I'm here to help you deal with a situation or some behavior, but then also having this awareness of you're also probably grieving some of this while looking for solutions. And so I think a lot of times the messiness of life with this can really just make it so easy for individuals to be experiencing this disenfranchised grief and completely ignore their needs for uh, care for themselves, right? They're just pushing on, trying to get through the situation, but really they're, they're having all of these experiences with this disenfranchised grief. And so, exactly. yeah. Uh, so for th those, like, do you have any kind of suggestions as far as if someone that has had disenfranchised loss and, or are kind of going through that process, what kind of th things would you recommend or suggest for them? Um, I think I, it, what I'm going to say is going to be applicable to all grief. Yeah. You know, it's not just this disenfranchised grief. I think it's yeah. especially for this, Yeah. but I think, you know, for those listening that this doesn't mean that like regular grief is now going to disenfranchise right, right, because yeah. we're talking about disenfranchised grief, but yeah. that this can be applicable to all of it. And kind of the four things that I like to stick to is like, validate the loss. Yes. Um, you yeah. know, this could be like just giving context to it, um, yeah. writing it down, saying it out loud. Um, I think there's so much when we're able to verbally express something, we're able to put words to it and we can name it. Yes. That gives us this power to understand ourselves, understand yeah. our own experience. Yeah. And then be able to now we're free to communicate that to someone else and yes. we're free to invite someone else in to understanding our hurt and our pain. And then that person can come alongside of us. Yeah. So I think acknowledge your loss and validate it. Um, yeah. sit in the ick. <laughs> this is one of my yeah. favorite just yeah. phrases. It's so easy to remember, but this is an icky feeling, you yeah. know, this is never going to be easy. Um, so just sit in that, um, yeah. allow yourself, you know, to, have time to really feel those emotions. Um, this could be, you know, grief is rarely line linear. Yeah. Um, emotions may not make sense throughout that process. You know, one day you might be 
crying for reasons that you don't know. And another, you might, you know, kind of just be able to go through your day yes. and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and looking for ways to safely express your emotions. Um, so that could be through journaling, exercise, listening to music, crying, allowing yourself to cry. You know, if you're in a safe space or you're able to get to a safe space to do that. Um, and talking to a trusted friend. Mm. Um, yeah. And then, uh, learn, learn and connect. I think there's so much value in being able to expose ourselves and watch someone's story that's similar to ours, yes. that brings that comfort of, I am not in this alone. And I, now I'm able to visualize like, oh, this is what it looks like. And yeah. this is how that person did it. So this could be through movies. It could be through books. Um, our blog post on disenfranchised grief has a very extensive list of books and movies at the end of it. If yeah. you're trying to figure out one that maybe matches up to your story, yeah. um, and connecting with others that have experienced similar loss, you know? So if that means a support group, um, I know like for addiction, there's support groups for partners, you know, yes. spouses or partners who's, you know, experiencing that addiction through their partner. Um, you know, there's support groups for families and kids of parents with addiction problems, yeah. you know? So being able to engage in those parts of our community, I think is really key. Um, and just identifying the people in your direct support network that can offer the types of support you need. So this might look like, you know, nobody can ever give us everything we need. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, if you're able to identify the people in your support network, like I know this person would be willing to come have dinner with me once a week and mm -hmm. saying like that can be how they help me. And then asking for that, you know, or supporting someone else who, you know, can act as a sounding board, yeah, you know, and just that's willing to bounce off of you. I think that's going to be really important. Um, and then the last thing is we, just move through life and we start to adjust and adapt to this new normal is remembering through ritual. Um, mm. I think that rituals are, can be really sacred. Um, they can be really yeah. regulating. Yeah. Um, and so this can honor and give meaning to your loss. That could be, um, maybe it's making a meal that, that, person that was lost or that relationship that was lost, like making a meal mm -hmm. periodically that yeah. reminds you of that, where you can just kind of go through the motions and think, um, it could be wearing a certain jewelry item or item of clothing that makes you feel close to that person. Yeah. Um, or just, you know, simply celebrating significant dates, you know, so anniversaries, um, birthdays, days of loss even can be really therapeutic for some people. Yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I love the practical advice with that. And I think I, I also really appreciate how it's kind of first start out with kind of your own internal working process. Mm -hmm. and I know for me as an individual that in the kind of the attachment style uh, spectrum of uh, attachment styles, I tend to lean more towards like the dismissing avoidant side, <laughs> which oftentimes means I'm going to, my natural tendency is just to minimize and kind of push it aside and keeps like focused on what do I got to achieve? Who do I need to be strong for? And I think one of the things that I'm just so much appreciating, right, is that sense of like, no, I need to be okay with, as you said, sitting in the ick of it and just kind of naming that, um, that, for many of you out there that might be kind of like me, um, where you tend to want to just kind of push through. And I think there's a lot of foster mm -hmm. and adoptive families that tend to kind of fall in that. They're going, I'm going to push through for the benefit of someone else. But I think the more that I've learned about myself and in just the counseling experience, um, we are uh, our best selves when we give ourselves that care, like you're mm -hmm. saying, which means I got to name it for myself. And even if uh, that grief is uncomfortable or embarrassing um, or is rubbing up against maybe a sense of identity or failure, um, I think those are the things for me that's always so hard is when it's like, for instance, like a disruption, right? Mm -hmm. I think about disruption 
there's this sense of like, well, there's relief and I'm kind of happy that there's relief, but now I'm also having to deal with this sense of, I expected this child to be with me. And Mm -hmm. now I feel maybe like a failure in some ways. And I know in, in experiences, oftentimes that raw sense is just so, so hard. And so to be able to just even write that down, I'm like, wow, how powerful that would be. Um, and so thank you. I, I, I just, I really appreciate that. And so thinking about that and kind of going, okay, uh, here are great activities, self-care for you to kind of engage if you're going through it. it. What would you say as far as to supporting loved ones that are, maybe you see someone that's going through a, a grief that's icky and sticky Mm -hmm. and whatever, what, what advice would you maybe have for them? Yeah. Um, I think it's going to mirror really closely what we can do for ourselves. You know, it's when we're acknowledging the loss, it's going to look more like helping your loved one name their loss and not just glossing over it. I think a lot of times with grief, um, especially in American culture, it's this thing that we'd rather just gloss over. Yeah, We would rather just, you know, do do your, um, your grief cycle, you know, let it take maybe a year tops. Right. And then let's get it over with. Because, so I think when we're sitting with those people that we love, I think to really engage that empathy, um, and help them name it. So if it's a family where, you know, kind of just bringing in another element is maybe it's a mother who has experienced multiple miscarriages Yes, and, sitting with that mother and just saying to her, like, I am so sorry that you're experiencing this disappointment of miscarriage, that you're grieving this loss of these dreams so many times Yes, and telling them like, I see you, you know, I am here with you. I love you and we're going to get through this. You know, there's no timeline on it, but we will. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be really important, you know, and that's being brave ourselves to be able to sit with people in that. Yeah. Um, And I I just have to say, just identifying with that, my wife and I, we had gone Mm -hmm. through a miscarriage in our, I mean, we have five kids now, but Mm -hmm. in there, there was, there was a miscarriage. And I remember, um, feeling like, I can't talk about my feelings and it was in a sincere, like, I want to protect my wife, Billy. And so I don't want to kind of be vulnerable because I feel like maybe that's going to crush her if she felt the kind of the weight of the feelings that I have in Mm -hmm. there. And I was really good about kind of pushing it away. But as we went through therapy with that, um, it was amazing to see when I just became vulnerable with my own emotion related to that, it was almost like a relief to her because she was like, Oh, I'm not alone with this. I I literally thought you were just not, this wasn't affecting you. And I'm Mm -hmm. going, how could you not think it was affecting me? Right. But like, but it's interesting how even that was so benefit beneficial for her and for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was so afraid that it was going to crush her because she was dealing with the weight of her own emotions. But Mm -hmm. there is something super therapeutic of, I'm going to join you in that grief Mm -hmm. and I'm going to let it affect me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it does affect me and you're not alone. So thank you. I, I absolutely agree. And so for those of you out there that are dealing with, um, anything that is related to grief as a couple, um, I think one of the best things that you can do is really be open and honest and kind of sit in the ick and kind of talk about it together, Mm -hmm. which means you have to kind of create space for that. Right. And that's, Mm -hmm. that can be really hard for how busy we keep our lives. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think I love what you said about, um, it, it having, letting it affect you. Yeah. I think that's so big in this whole grief thing. Yeah. Um, and that if we could just do that more often with people, Amen. let it, ex- let it affect us. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I think other ways for loved ones, for you to support your loved ones would just 
look like figuring out who you can be for them. You know, like we said, like for those experiencing loss, figure out who in your network can do what. Yeah. For those supporting your loved ones, figure out what you can do for them. Figure out what person you can be, be for them. Mm. Um, so maybe you're the meal train person. Maybe yeah. you're the person, yeah. you know, maybe if you know your strengths are an organization and, you know, getting people together and rally behind something, maybe that's your role and you're yeah. that person. Um, maybe you're the person that, you know, you just go over and you bring a bottle of wine and yes, this is what you are, yeah. right? You yeah. know, or yeah. some coffee or tea and you sit and you just, yeah. or you just bring some normalcy. Maybe you're just the normalcy person and that's good because that's still needed in yes. that process of just feeling like, oh, I yeah. can still find some respite mm. in this oh, I love that. Yeah. Like this balance, you're not, you sit in it, mm -hmm. but you're okay. It's okay to set it down mm -hmm. and enjoy life. Take a breath, mm -hmm. right? You don't, you don't have to hold on to it and you don't have to hide it in the closet either, right? Like it's this kind of this balance of pick it up, hold it, set it down. Yeah. It's grief kind of process. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So for those of you that are out there and you're thinking, Yep. I've got some disenfranchised grief. I hope this, this, this discussion is helpful for you and encouraging you in the next steps. I know there's a lot of you that are out there that can feel frozen by this and just kind of overwhelm and stuck in that. Um, CFC, Arizona Family Counseling, we're here for you to help you work through that. And I think sometimes um, we, we need that professional support. And so we would love to help you uh, through that in working through whatever type of grief that you're experiencing, whether you have a great support system or not. Um, I think we even have people that are well supported and yet they're going, I should feel over this now, or because I have all this support and things have been so great. And yet I'm just emotionally stuck in that. And so I think there's just so many, like you said, grieving is so different with, with each individual. And so for those of you out there, please uh, check out the link below for Arizona family counseling. And we would love to support you with that. Megan, thank you so much for your support and yeah. talking and through this today. I think even just to add on to what you're saying yeah. is just a reminder that it doesn't have to be any amount of time. You know, yes. you could come yeah. and it could be a year past your grief or past your loss, you know, or it could yeah. be three days past your loss. I know personally, it's like I'm 10 years and I'm just starting that journey, right. you know, of processing through that. And so yeah. there is no timestamp on when you it's mm. OK to start. Yeah. Um, just oh, start. Man. And yeah. it's, it's, um, we're here for that. Yeah. It, which we'll have to do another podcast yeah. <laughs> another time, but even thinking about, um, the Vander Kolk's, how the body mm -hmm. keeps the score, what talks about like, so what happens with preverbal trauma and mm -hmm. that you're kind you store it physiologically preverbally. So you don't have words for it. You might not even remember it, but even this kind of grief that comes along with things that have happened early in your life. And so maybe we'll have to have another podcast about that. But mm -hmm. for today, disenfranchised grief, we're here for you. Check us out. ArizonaFamilyCounseling.com. Thanks.